from Washington to New York to our viewers worldwide. A very good morning. I'm Manus Cranny filling in for Jonathan Farrow. The equity markets are grappling with more hawkish Fed speak and de-escalation from Israel on Iran. Is that the context? We'll count you down to the open right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up in the show, markets on edge over escalating tensions in the Middle East. Fed officials continue to push their higher for longer rhetoric. The stocks flirt with their worst week since October. This is Netflix misses the mark. The bar was high. We begin with the big issue. Geopolitical tensions, they're at the forefront. First, the G7 condemned the unprecedented uh, Iranian attack on Israel. Unprecedented in scope and scale. Scope because it was a direct attack on Israel from Iran. Scale because it involved more than 300 uh, munitions, including ballistic missiles. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating, uh, to trying uh, to bring uh, this tension to a, to a close. Well, Bloomberg's Amory Hordern has been at the World Bank meetings throughout the past couple of days. She's in Washington, D.C., so we can certainly take the very immediate reaction. There was Blinken uh, talking about this. From a market's perspective, Anne-Marie, talk me through the response from Israel to Iran. How well telegraphed was that? Were there warnings given? And the market seems to be reading this situation as a non-escalatory response. Good morning. That's exactly right. You know, we've been hearing from Goldman Sachs, and they were talking about the fact that there's between 5 to $10 priced in the price of oil, and but you won't see it escalate beyond that and go higher unless there was this retaliatory cycle. And right now what it does feel like is that this is contained. What you saw from Israel in, ter in terms of their retaliation on Iran, it went to a city called Isfayan. And this city is incredibly important because not only was it one of the areas where Iran fired off their missiles and drones to Israel last week and over the weekend, but this is a place where there's nuclear facilities. So Israel was sending a clear message. We can hit your nuclear facilities. We can stunt your nuclear capability. Do not test us. And that is why you see the market start to ratchet this back down. In Iran, they're even downplaying this. And you don't even see a National Security Council meeting over in Tehran because of this. So it does feel like this could be the end of this specific episode. But clearly, overall, what you hear in conversations at, at the IMF in Washington, D.C., is that geopolitical issues in itself remain large. And I just see some headlines dropping on the terminal now that the United States is expanding the scope of their sanctions on Russia and Iran. But, Matt, as you and I both know well, you can write down sanctions, but enforcing them is a completely different issue. It is. And this has been the greatest accusation of all in regards to the oil cap price that uh, was coordinated. Was it ever really that effective? Anthony Blinken says, again, Israel makes its decisions and we have a commitment to defending it. I just wondered to what extent, Amri, this was uh, Netanyahu calibrating to take consideration of Lord Cameron along with, this, along with the U.S. Uh, saying, you know, think with your heads, not with your heart, uh, and to this, this call behind the scenes for a recalibration from the United States of America. I like what RBC Halima Croft had to write, which is this is about the metastasization of this. We are not done with this geopolitical issue by a long chalk. Right. This is just potentially the end of one little chapter we had. I would note two things. I think Netanyahu needed to show deterrence, but also wanted to show a little bit of restraint to put a little bit of a close on this specific chapter, because you had the very hawkish national security advisor in the Israeli government come out and in one word tweet in Hebrew say, weak. So he wanted to see more. Yeah. Uh, so potentially you're seeing some of that, some of that restraint. Um, and of course, the second thing is that at the same time this is happening, you have the U.S. Congress about to uh, send over more aid to Israel and the Wall Street Journal this morning reporting that the Biden administration is weighing another $1 billion when it comes to weapons to Israel. So even though they told uh, Netanyahu, do not take the win, do not retaliate, they still seem like they are completely backing Israel. 
Okay, Amri, thank you very much. Great work, you and the team. Uh, over the past couple of days in Washington, joining me now is Terry Wiseman, Macquarie Group. Terry, uh, good to see you this morning. Um, we're just listening to Anne Marie. We're trying to understand the calibration of markets' response uh, to the to these actions by Israel. Your very first take on this. You talk about the axis of war and peace. You talk about uh, the inverted smile, uh, a bona fide peace without a war of attrition and without the threat of a wider regional war in our Mideast would be disinflationary. I put it to you, Terry, it's a bit early to make that call that that's where we are. Yeah, look, the, the, the point of, of what I was trying to say a few days ago is that if you are a bondholder, and this is specifically a view that pertains to bonds, not to FX, uh, not, not to the stock market, but if you're a bondholder, you generally want to see two things. You generally want to see disinflation, because that will keep bond yields low and prices high for bonds. Or, you know, in a manner of speaking, you want to see a, a global conflagration. You want to see total war. Why? Because that's going to cause a flight of uh, uh, into safety, out of risk assets, out of stocks, and the beneficiary of that is typically uh, U.S. Treasury bonds, and then yields would fall and prices would rise. So those two extremes are generally good for bonds. And we saw a little bit of a flavor of that uh, last night when you saw the first initial reports of the Israeli strike on Iran. While people don't didn't understand yet that this was a limited strike, but they thought it could lead to uh, uh, out, out, uh, full out war, uh, bond prices did in fact rise, yields fell. But when we realized that this was limited war, that this is still in the confines of a shadow war, uh, uh, when global conflict generally these days takes place on borders, like you see with in the case of Ukraine and Russia, those limited wars are not good for bondholders. All it does is keep the tension and expectations and the price premiums and things like oil high. That is not good for um, for a bondholder because you don't get the disinflation that you'd want to see if you are holding bonds. At the same time, you don't get the massive flight to quality out of stocks and into bonds that you would see with a much graver uh, conflagration, much graver situation polit geopolitically. My point is that when you're in the middle between total peace and total war, you don't want to be holding bonds. No, and you, you talk about this, the, the most sort of ill-fated place to be is the uncertain middle. We look at oil. I mean, I look at the price action yesterday in oil four bucks. I look at bonds down 14 basis points. And there is this immediate vault face uh, this morning when we understand the, the nuances of the strike. Here we are kissing 90 bucks on oil. And yet oil in of itself is not dislocating the bond market. At what stage does the price of oil really begin to kick into the bond market? Look, the relationship is not necessarily linear, but if, uh, but I don't believe that the rally in the price of oil and and gasoline in the U.S. over the last few weeks has had nothing to do with the rise in, in in bond yields and maybe the suffering that we've seen in the equity market. To some extent, it has, even though uh, you know traders tend to associate an increase in oil with the non-core component of CPI and the PCE. Uh, price index. I like to think that ultimately, if you get even what we've seen uh, in terms of the increase in oil prices, it, it, it will have an effect on inflation. Put it this way, um, uh, fuel prices do enter into the general cost of business for sure, so they do have to raise prices on other things. But more importantly, you know, when, when workers sit down with their bosses to negotiate wages, they don't say, um, you know, they don't look at core inflation. They look at the things they need to buy, which yeah. includes food, which includes gasoline. So uh, if, if headline inflation goes up, but core doesn't, I think it can still have an indirect effect on core inflation down the road, simply by virtue of the fact that it increases wages, not just in the goods industry, but in the services industry, which are critical to, to core inflation. So I don't like this increase in the price of oil. I do think that it is ultimately something that the Fed would, could have to respond to. It's something that has been driving bond prices uh, lower and yields higher. And, and it's as simple as that. Of course, if oil prices were to rise even further, on uh, an escalation or expansion of, the, of this war to the rest of the region or to include the superpowers. Of course, uh, that would be inflationary as well. Uh, but keep in mind, like I said before, it would not necessarily be bad for bonds because at that point you could see that flight to quality.
Terry, what do you make of the past 48 hours of the dissent in regards to the strength of the dollar around the world? And some would say the tacit acceptance by Secretary Yellen to allow the Japanese and the South Koreans to intervene. We don't know what shape and what form, but there is, there is growing global dissent with the strength of the dollar. Right. And, and central banks around the world are addressing this in two separate ways, two clear and distinct but yet separate ways. One of them is the threat intervention. So we've seen that, for example, from, uh, from Japan, from the BOJ. We've seen that from the BOK in Korea. Uh, we have seen outright intervention on the part of, of uh, Malaysia. That's one way to address the problem. The other way to address the problem is not to talk about intervention uh, and to talk about simply tightening monetary policy. And that we've seen from a few of the emerging market central banks in the last few days. Uh, we've seen, for example, the rhetoric come out, coming out of Brazil and Mexico from the officials at the IMF meetings talk in a more hawkish direction. Of course, some central banks might ultimately do both, right? Japan is a classic situation here where they could do both because they have a history of having intervened in the FX market. They did so in 2022 in the fourth quarter, for example. Uh, but they are also moving already in the direction of tighter monetary policies. For, in that case, you could easily conceive of the BOJ doing both, mm -hmm. to strengthen their hand. And it's one reason why I would not be a buyer of dollar yen, let's say, at 155 here. I think that's a good target, but the skew is downward, i.e. towards a, conceivably a lower dollar yen because of these threats. Indeed. Well, you know, history shows that unilateral intervention in of itself is usually folly uh, and money ill spent. But when you're looking at a, a, a tripartite uh, agreement with the U.S. driving the bus, it certainly uh, can spook some of the dollar bulls on dollar yen. Terry, thank you very much. Stay with us. Uh, more to do. We're going to dig into some of the Fed speak. Uh, <coughs> joining me now ahead of the opening bell, it's Abigail Doolittle, side by side with the details. Abby, what have you got? Well, man, it's right now we're looking at the possibility of a six down day in a row for the S&P 500. That would be the longest losing streak going back to October 2022. And one big weight is Netflix. Shares are down 6.9 percent. This after the massive first quarter beat. But it's not to last. The forecast for the current a uh, quarter relative to revenue, uh, a bit tepid, disappointing. Plus, they will stop reporting subscriber numbers in 2025, given the fact that the stock was up basically 90% over the last year into today, investors selling it off. Trading down in sympathy, at like, least the last time I looked, to some degree, Microsoft, this will be one of the next big companies, tech companies, uh, to report next Thursday. Actually, you can see not much of a reaction. More of a reaction from streaming competitor Disney, down 1%. And then take a look at Paramount Global, uh, a content creator competitor, soaring up 8.9%, having nothing to do with Netflix, having everything to do that will, with the speculation that Apollo and Sony may submit a joint bid for the media giant. We will, of course, be talking more about that, Manus, that possibility at the Open. Okay, Abby, thank you very much. Uh, we're counting down to the Open. We're 18 minutes away. Uh, coming up, sounds like higher for longer. I'm of the view that things are going to be slow enough this year that we won't be in a position uh, to reduce our rates. Uh, toward, until toward the end of the year. Well, Fed officials see little urgency for rate cuts. The conversation next on Bloomberg. Inflation is high. It's too high, too high, and we need to get it to our 2% target. The pathway to 2% is going to be slower than people expect, uh, and it'll be bumpy. I'm of the view that things are going to be slow enough this year that we won't be in a position uh, to reduce our rates uh, toward, until toward the end of the year. Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic there signaling higher rates are here to stay. The hot U.S. economy drawing criticism from other countries around the world in Washington this week. German Finance Minister Christian Linder saying earlier in the week, I don't want to be impolite. But if we look at the economic development in the U.S., the inflation rate is higher again, and this forces the Fed to react. For more on the Fed and how it reacts, let's bring in Bloomberg's Liz McCormick. You know, Liz, there's a great saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and the good intentions are we hope to be able to be cutting. But, of course, Bostick and uh, Williams both fly the kite, fly the kite marginally, of higher rates, but then, then dampen it down. Why fly that kite at all? 
Well, I think, well, first of all, let's be fair to John Williams, who was asked that question, right, uh, Manis? He was said, what, do you think you could see higher rates? So he has to answer. And he said something like possible. So, but I think you're right. The fact that, you know, he nodded to it's a possibility and like you just played the clip of Bostic um, saying, you know, maybe not cuts till the end of the year. And I think he might have even flipped to maybe next year. Um, I think, in, in, in fact, Chairman Powell on Tuesday at the conference in D.C. that he spoke at, he kind of said not hikes, but kind of a, a stronger clarity on we could be higher for longer, kind of if inflation doesn't perform. So I think there's been a bit of a sea change and a nod to like, Hey, we at the Fed are going to still, you know, make sure we do what we have to do. If inflation doesn't yeah. come down, we'll stay higher for longer. Or if we have to, they'll hike. I don't. Well, look, I suppose I latched on to the Williams thing because it really did spook markets. I think when they invect optionality to a hike, suddenly we become myopically obsessed that that door is open. But as you say, we need to be a little bit more controlled and contained. I love your article this morning. Um, everybody should go and read it because you get a nice little insight on the five-year, five-year forwards. Now, this is about the anchoring or the unanchoring of inflation expectations, and there are people out there that are concerned about the unanchoring or disanchoring of inflation expectations. Take me through the thesis. Yeah, so the Fed has always, they've made clear that Inflation expectations are important to them. They factor that into their thoughts when they're thinking about policy. And, you know, Chairman Powell has in the past nicely explained it. Like, the risk is that if inflation, it could go two-sided, but let's talk where we are now, that if people continue to think inflation's getting higher, higher expectations, it could bleed into actual inflation. Now, right now, and they look at long run because there's a lot of noise in short run. So, yeah, and that article is talking to Benson Durham, who's at Piper Sandler, but he was at the Fed. New York and the board, very good wonky options guy. But he, he looks at long run, five year, five year forward inflation expectations, even kind of models them to splice out some other forces, say like liquidity premiums, and says, you know, they're they're too high. They're not screaming, you know, fire in a crowded theater right now, but they're they're too high, they're above the Fed's target, and the Fed will be, you know, that he thinks is what could really, his words, get the Fed's goat if they start to really unanchor. Um, so that's on the radar of people. Like, you have to keep those contained. Um, of course, actual inflation has been troublesome three months in a row, yeah. hot CPI. So we'll see. And this geopolitics and oil uh, really take another leg higher, Liz. It, 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 it can manifestly change the narrative as well. Great column. I uh, encourage everybody to go and read it this morning. Liz McCormick uh, on the bond markets. My guests this morning are Morgan Zanny's Dan Kelly, Macquarie's Terry Wiseman. Terry will be with me uh, in, just a m in just a moment. Dan Scully is with me. That's the beauty of live TV. Dan, good to see you in the end. Here we are. Good to see you. So I've just looked at bonds for the month. They're up 40 basis points. The bond market has aggressively repriced to a higher for longer narrative. I would say stocks have got away with it so far. Do I de-risk? Do I still have an option to protect myself? How do you look at the bond repricing relative to equity? Yeah, excellent question and good morning. And I think it's a, it's a function of what you do within your allocation, right? And on that particular note, just this week, our Global Investment Committee, led by Lisa Shallot, uh, made a couple of allocation changes to our, uh, our outlook in terms of adding to larger cap equities, uh, reducing small caps, and actually reducing some of our uh, fixed income exposure on the duration side. And importantly, adding to real assets, right? So again, it's a question of staying invested here, yes, but mixing up the allocations within your portfolio to adjust to what's obviously a very fluid environment. And that's what you basically say, net, 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 this pullback is a healthy correction of overbought yes. conditions. And the valuations are discounting an unreasonable rate of expectations. I mean, we haven't seen a major drawdown. We've seen a skirmish in these equity markets. Um, we're going to go into earnings season at plenty next week. Netflix has its own tortured set of narrative in the past 24 hours. Procter & Gamble are raising prices. The stock is injured this morning somewhat. Um, what are you expecting from earnings report next week that can create a solid flaw in the equity market? 
It's such a great question because next week is where the real fireworks, I think, could happen. You have 40% of the S&P reporting next week, uh, inclusive of all those big uh, tech names. The implied volatility and the implied one-day movement in S&P holding uh, reactions on, on earnings this season is actually the highest it's been in over a decade. Uh, and so, look, our expectation is that many of the quality, scaled, strong free cash flow, still positive earnings revision type tech names can do fine. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. think, again, we are more um, cautious on some of the more lower quality, leveraged, smaller cap names. Uh, and so I guess the final thing I would say is, you know, this particular, you alluded to it, a, a skirmish, a mini correction off the March 28th high has been notable in that all of the first quarter leaders in tech, com communication services, energy, have actually mm -hmm. been the most defensive since the sell-off, which is telling us this isn't a real growth scare. It's not a real economic, um, you know, cautious sell-off, because if it were, you'd be seeing the dividend and the defensive sectors like utilities, like Staples doing better. So again, this is a pause that refreshes in our view. Just very briefly, you also make it very clear. I mean, the SOX index is down, I, I think, in the cash down 5.34 on the week. But you talk about a differentiation between only bigger energy versus the semis and the industrial data present, uh, you know, the energy and the semiconductors that feed the data centers. You want to be longer a big energy relative to the semis. Uh, for, for the moment, yes, but let's not deny the fact that some of the semis still have tremendous secular tailwinds. I think this is obviously a market that had gotten, uh, you know, over its skis in terms yeah. of cut expectations. Now that is adjusting. So some of those growthier assets and stocks are, are resetting. But longer term, we still like many of those exposures. Um, and so, yes, it is, it is a question about the long term versus the short term. I also want to just caveat, right, that when we think about a better economy, the inflationary environment, and you want to own some value, you want to own quality value, right? You want to okay. own those names that still have good balance sheets and that in some cases are utilizing technology and Dan? actually in some instances utilizing AI themselves. Dan, we got to cut it off there. Uh, unfortunately, the clock has ticked against us. We can't down to that uh, earnings report sheet next week. Dan Skelly of Morgan Stanley on Bloomberg. Let's get you your morning calls. First up, Can Accord downgrades Netflix to a hold, expecting a period of slower growth. Wolf Research upgrades Bank of America to outperform, seeing notable upside ahead. And Morgan Stanley upgrades Spot Shopify to overweight, growing increasingly confident on its growth. Equities are nervous as we go to the close of the week. The dominant theme is Fed speak, which is hawkish, from Williams and Bostic in a relative sense to the geopolitical situation, which is being assessed at the moment as de-escalation. Do you trust that? These are your markets. We're set for a dip uh, as we start trading this Friday morning. The rest of your asset classes look a little bit like this. The dollar has had a heck of a run uh, this week, both from a geopolitical aspect, uh, but of course then this drop in yield that you've seen uh, on the de-escalation risk in the Israel-Iran situation uh, lets the dollar drift and the euro bid. Ten years down by three basis points. We dropped by 14 basis points yesterday. You saw this haven status of the bond market. We're at 4.6 percent. Uh, when will we uh, possibly touch 5 percent? Does real money come in at these levels? Uh, crude comes back to flat. We did spike uh, higher uh, yesterday on this uh, retaliatory action from Israel uh, to Iran. Right now, it is being assessed as a non-escalatory confrontation. Do you trust that narrative? There's one stock to watch, Netflix. The shares are moving sharply lower with the downbeat revenue forecast. Ed Ludlow is with me. I mean, the subscriber numbers were blowout, Ed, but it is about the guidance, and that's where the questions arise. Yeah, anxiety on forecast. The stock is down around 7%, putting it on track for its biggest drop since July and trading at its lowest level since February of 2024. It was a strong quarter, right? They added 9.33 uh, million net new subscribers or customers in the quarter, which was almost double what the street had estimated. 
um, and revenue growth or top line growth of 15% was slightly above expectations. The guidance is that in the current period, that subscriber growth will slow even though top line growth of 16% would be a sequential quarter on quarter acceleration, but still below expectations, disappointing. It, it's a really interesting case study in corporate communication. We know what Netflix is and what it does, and they're saying that from 2025, we will stop reporting this quarterly subscriber gain or loss figure. And it is a figure that for all streaming platforms, investors have obsessed over. You know, there is probably more philosophical debate to have about the value of it. Netflix management want the street to be focused on, you know, bog standard traditional financial metrics like the bottom line. How exciting. But if you consider the quarter just gone, 9.33 million new customers, the story behind that was that the password clampdown worked. In other words, users that had been password sharing or sharing accounts with family and friends had to sign up for their own account for the first time. And so contemporaneously, we had an understanding of what was happening. We know the content slate is strong. So if they're going to stop giving us this metric, there is some hangover and anxiety from the street about that. And what management said is we will give you milestones when we hit big numbers along the way, but they're not buying it. The stock down more than 7%, biggest drop since July of last year. Happy Friday, Manus. I hope you're not showing your password, Ed Ludlow. That's all I'll say to you. Ed Ludlow there <laughs> on the Netflix story. Right, let's stick with streaming shares of Paramount. They're surging as Apollo and Sony are said to be considering a joint offer for the media company. Here with a little bit more detail, it is Abigail Doolittle. And that report, man, is coming as a bit of a relief because this stock down a lot over the last year. In fact, just this year alone down 25 percent. There is a significant bearish short interest, so some of today uh, could be a short squeeze. But yesterday there was a report of exactly what you said, that uh, Apollo is continuing a joint bid uh, for Paramount, all shares, uh, and they would be doing this with uh, Apollo and Sony together. Uh, it could, if it were to happen, would likely uh, assuage some of the financing concerns that Paramount management may have had with Apollo's prior $26 billion bid, uh, given Sony's deep pockets, basically makes Apollo a more attractive uh, when they come together with Sony. Now, there is, of course, the Sky Dance bid out there, but a lot of people thinking that that one might not go through or it wasn't necessarily well received. What is well received, especially given the fact that the stock is down so much, CDS on Paramount Global, senior CDS, have tightened 34 bips uh, on this report, Manus, the most in five months, suggesting maybe there's some hope hope that this deal, uh, again, right now it's just a report, speculation, but that maybe it will come to fruition and be successful. Yeah, well, we have this changing, changing media landscape. Abby, thank you very much. Abigail Doolittle uh, on the stock moves. Let's turn to EVs. Never far from our heart is Tesla. Pairing the earlier declines, this was following a recall of nearly 3,900. The Cybertruck, faulty pedals. Alex Seminova is with me. They just don't need this level of bad news on the Cybertruck, do they? Indeed, Manus, good morning. The troubles do just seem to keep piling up for Tesla. The EV, ma EV maker received uh, complaints from two customers related to this pedal malfunction. This is according to a recall reported, report submitted to the U.S. National Highway Safety Administration. They say that when high force is applied applied to the Cybertruck's accelerator, the pedal may dislodge and get stuck, increasing the risk of a crash. Sounds quite dangerous there. That's resulted in the recall of nearly 4,000 vehicles. And of course, it's been a really challenging year for Tesla. Shares are moving higher after he heavy selling this morning, but it's down about 40% this year. And earlier this month, the owner of a Cybertruck recorded a viral TikTok video where he described uh, the accelerator pedal uh, getting loose while he was driving, and he was stuck in full throttle. As of April 15th, Tesla said that it was not aware of any collisions, crashes, or deaths related to this. CEO Elon Musk on X said that they were just being extra cautious here. Manus. Okay, well, it's a big week for Tesla next week, isn't it, in terms of the future on the, uh, the Model 2 and other details. Alex, thank you very much. Alex Seminova. Turn over to the earnings season. American Express gains this as revenue tops the estimates. Simone Foxman is with me, so we're spending on Amex. Yeah, and especially consumers continue to flock towards Amex's premium cards. Uh, fees from premium cards, uh, or sorry, cards with a fee accounted for 70% of new account acquisitions, a lot of those coming from Gen Z and millennials. 
Uh, apparently markets like this, although this stock opened flat uh, at the open. Uh, if you look at, through the financials that came out this morning, broadly, slightly better than expectations. We had revenue up 11% year on year. That was a slightly higher. Expenses slightly lower. And the firm set aside $1.3 billion for delinquencies. That's a, a tick higher year on year basis, but really in line with what the street had expected. And that allowed earnings per share to come in at $3.33, better than the estimate of $2.96, the company maintaining top and bottom line guidance. Amex says its high-end consumer that it really caters to is very strong and it continues to remain strong. The CFO is saying we're not seeing any softness at all in terms of demand for premium cards, uh, reporting a 9% growth in spending, especially on airlines, especially in first class and business class. Uh, William Blair calls this a strong start to 2024, but they say that they're really waiting on an investor day that will be April 30th, Manus. I still travel coach. Simone, thank you very <laughs> so much. <laughs> Simone Foxman there with the very latest on American Express. Now, global markets are struggling to recalibrate and balance between the hawkish Fed speak from Williams and Bostic, as well as the Israeli retaliation against Iran. S&P 500 now tracking its biggest weekly decline since October. Joining me now with the view on the market, it is David Bianco of CIO over at DWS. David, good to have you with us. So here we are. There's a number of different big themes at play. Do I just have to be strong, accept a higher for longer narrative and a higher inflation environment and begin to adjust accordingly? Well, that's right. I think they're not so much new issues, just we're getting a little bit more clarity on these issues and things aren't working out quite as the, the biggest optimist or biggest bulls had expected. I think what we're seeing this week um, with, I think it's setting the tone for the summer. And I think it will be a soft uh, summer for, for markets. Uh, I think the S&P 500 is going to work its way below 5,000, kind of settle in a 4,700 to 5,000 trading range up until the election. And, and the reasons at this stage, uh, it's becoming pretty obvious. Uh, the Fed's going to have to wait longer before they begin cutting, and we'll even find out how much they, they eventually cut. And uh, the geopolitical situation we know is still running hot. And the valuation at the S&P 500, particularly against these interest rates and just a 20.5 P.E. multiple on this year's earnings estimates, this is still an expensive P.E. And that's why next week, where about 40 percent of earnings are reported, the beats need to be big. The beats really need to be over 5 percent on average for us to have any, you know, continued confidence that the $243 that we and the street are estimating are really achieved because those estimates for the year are back end loaded with a lot of growth coming in the third and especially fourth quarter of this year. Where is the biggest susceptibility to disappointment on what you need to create the floor? We're at the money now at the moment. We're at the money at 5000 so next week could be pivotal to open up the trap door to 4750 So where is the susceptibility in this reporting season? Well, there are two key parts of the S&P 500, and each of those parts has their own susceptibilities. Uh, the 492 S&P 500 index stocks that are not the grade eight digital type names, they're susceptible to a further increase in interest rates. And I would argue their PEs at about 18 and a half on average are very high versus a 4.6% 10 year treasury yield or 2.2% 10 year tips yield. So the 492 is at risk uh, to, to these and higher interest rates. And when we look at the earnings that are, that are, that are coming from those companies, um, particularly X financials, there are some green shoots of improved earnings growth. But if those companies don't beat by at least 5%, mm -hmm. uh, then there'll be flat earnings growth year on year again, again, for the S&P 492. So, I mean, there are pockets of strength, industrials, there are pockets of weakness, uh, energy and others. But uh, th this is really sluggish earnings growth outside of the great eight. And at these interest rates, that's a concern. I always feel like the other I'm part the of the market. <laughs> The other part of the market's the grade eight, and they have to just deliver tremendous earnings growth and very optimistic outlooks and continue to disclose all the data they can on their operations to keep investors confident and, and very uh, uh, exuberant about the, the long-term view. And keep them, keep them on site. Um, th 
you know, I always read the fund manager survey from Bank of America and I always feel like I'm the poor mm -hmm. retail victim left at the back of the bus, you know, that forgot to get off at the right stop. Big money, institutional money, smart money, as I've written down here, $21 billion flowed out in the last two weeks, the biggest outflow since 2022. And yet the fund manager survey is the most bullish since January 2022. What do you see in terms of flow? Are the retail like me left on this bus at the moment, vulnerable to a material drawdown when institutional flow is taking money out? Well, I think when you look at different investor types, uh, big money, institutional money has an asset allocation type mindset. And big money is definitely noticing uh, the attractive, the, the attractive risk-adjusted opportunity being provided by bonds right now. Yeah. Short duration, but also inflation-protected longer bonds. And that just cannot be denied by those who have to make and do make decisions across asset classes. I think they're going to use uh, these short-term interest rates to see how things play out and, and take a little f and further risk off the table. Um, I would argue that retail investors, where we have seen signs of, of, of their risk appetite cooling a bit, they are still confident in the AI story. Uh, but I, I, I think uh, you know, those type of investors also need to be a little bit more appreciative of valuations and that not every company is going to be a winner in the end. And competition will heat up in that space, particularly semiconductors. Yeah, well, I mean, I had the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund with, with myself and Danny just the other day, and they, they are cautious about the valuations in tech and not so much that monetization can't happen, it's just how quickly it can happen in the AI space and the timeline to that margin. You talk about financials, we talk about this higher for longer narrative, you talk about the valuations right. not exactly being stretched. We've just gone through the reporting um, with JP Morgan, with Wells Fargo, uh, with Goldman Sachs, etc. Right. Differentiate for me now on financials in terms of whether you want to be in regionals, whether you believe the CRE is passed or whether you want to be on the big beasts. So let me start by saying we are a little cautious on markets uh, going into the summer before uh, the election. And, and financials are clearly higher beta stocks. Uh, but those who are more optimistic and those who are looking to, you know, make plans for where to act upon a dip, uh, we would point out big financials, big banks, big insurance, big asset managers, uh, big brokers, big exchanges. And the results that are coming out of these companies are good, and capital markets activity is good and has potential to, to further accelerate. Um, but I think big is the, the, the key theme when it comes to financials. Um, these, the, these big institutions have the deposit base. They've got the confidence of, their, uh, of those who, who buy their securities. And they, 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 they are the ones in the position to continue to invest in technology, AI productivity. I'm, af I'm really afraid that smaller banks and smaller financials in general are going to fall behind, be left behind. We know the challenges of regional banks. I don't want to overly beat up on them because those valuations <laughs> are beaten up. But I would stick with the big banks. I would stick with the big financials. Big is beautiful. And for those who've been arguing, yeah, big, big is, is beautiful. beautiful. David, we got to leave it there. We got to leave it there. You're right. All uh, right. Hunker down for 16. See you next Friday. <laughs> see, you, see you next Friday. $16 trillion worth uh, of, pay, of, of reporting. Uh, on the markets next week. David Bianco there of DWS, my guest on the markets. Coming up, Netflix stopping subscriber numbers. We're just perplexed. Why wouldn't you give subscriber numbers? They're just a little less confident um, and uh, don't want to surprise on the downside. The analysts are saying maybe this is a more mature company. We'll continue the conversation on Bloomberg. Why wouldn't you give subscriber numbers? They're just a little less confident um, and uh, don't want to surprise on the downside. The analysts are saying maybe this is a more mature company. Let's set the stage. Netflix posts, Netflix posts its best start to the year since 2020. 9.33 million subscribers. But the celebration was short-lived. The streamer announcing it will stop reporting quarterly subscriber numbers. How injurious is that? 
Gita Rangath Raganathan joins me now from Bloomberg Intelligence. Do you think that's really the reason why the market is so irked? They still say, still say that they will give us milestones, Gita. Um, they had a pretty strong subscriber growth, double what the original estimates were just a few weeks ago. Is that the flesh wound we're suffering this morning from, uh, the, the, this scare to guidance? Yeah, it most certainly is, Manus. I mean, that was a very, very high quality uh, first quarter earnings report. There's no doubt about it. They outperformed on all the metrics that we were looking at. Guidance also came in pretty much in line, but I think this whole point of them uh, s s going to stop their subscriber as well as their ARPU disclosures starting in the first quarter of 2025 has really kind of spooked investors. But it really tells us is that, you know, maybe the company is entering this more mature phase and maybe, you know, subscriber growth is going to peak this year and it, it is going to start decelerate. And obviously they want to reduce the volatility around that reporting of subscriber metrics. I'm looking at your most recent note. It's a no house of cards, to quote you, not me. Um, 27 times forward earnings. Where does that rank relative to other streamers? And is that the discom is that the disconcern is that the disconcerting part of this narrative, which is if I look at Netflix on a relative basis to its other peers in this space, the numbers are not strong enough. Yeah, so that is the question, right? Should Netflix be mm -hmm. valued like a media company or should it be valued like a tech company? So if you kind of looked at where Netflix was trading before yesterday's earnings report, about 27 times forward EBITDA, that's double of where mm -hmm. its closest peer on the media side, Disney is trading, right? Disney is at about 13 times forward EBITDA. Again, you could, uh, but then again, you compare it to some of the other, you know, the TV uh, media peers like a Warner Brothers or a Paramount or a Fox, it's almost four times, uh, you, know, you know, that EBITDA multiple. So obviously, there's this huge delta. I would say Netflix justifies that multiple. And I would say that just based on their profitability metrics, uh, Manus, because you kind of look at what they've been able to achieve. Obviously, they have that first mover advantage in streaming. But then you look at some of their operating income metrics, $7.5 billion in profits last year, close to almost $9 billion is what we're expecting this year. Free cash flow has been on a tear. And then you look at their margins, right? And this has been the perennial question in media. Can Netflix ever represent replicate the old media model where you had these TV companies throwing off about 30, 30 percent margins and Netflix shows that they're already hitting 25 percent this year they probably are going to get to 30 percent in the next couple of years time and maybe even more than that maybe we're going to see them get to like 35 40 percent there's a lot of operating leverage in the model when you have scale and Netflix is showing us how it's done okay well it's certainly a juggernaut isn't it in terms of valuation and you lay the landscape very clearly in terms of the acceleration of margin expansion rather than headwind Gita thank you so much Gita uh, Raganathan there of Bloomberg Intelligence on your Netflix movers let's get to Abigail Doolittle she's got the other sector price action to wrap up the week well, we are looking at something that we have not seen since October of 2022, right now at least. The possibility of six down days for the S&P 500 in a row. Not surprisingly, communication services, which Netflix is a part of the worst sector on the day, down 1.3 percent, taking the other two mega cap tech sectors uh, with it to the upside energy, but up just eight tenths of one percent, unable at this point at least to outweigh some of uh, that point drag from mega cap tech, tech and Netflix in particular. As for the week, as you've been mentioning all morning, Manus, we are looking at the worst week potentially since October of last year. Uh, most sectors are lowered. The worst sectors are, uh, in part, some of those mega cap tech sectors, including the tech index down 4.9 percent, uh, having a lot to do with some of that chip weakness. Real estate also lower, down 3.7 percent, having to do with yields being higher. The dividends look less positive. Of course, rising yields not positive for the real estate sector. Then there's discretionary. Tesla await there. Energy, despite today's gain, well, it's down 1.5 percent. A little bit of a rough week here for stock investors. Yep, it's certainly uh, been one of the toughest week for quite a while. Abby, thank you very much. We're struggling with uh, higher rates, volatility on the geopolitical front. Coming up, we'll give you the market moving events to close off your week and set your trading diary on Bloomberg. Equity markets really are struggling with geopolitics and Fed speak. Netflix, are you sharing your 
you sharing your password. Uh, that's not what's dragging uh, Netflix lower this morning, but it is having weight on the NASDAQ. What's dragging it lower is about valuations. It's had a cracking run. They're not going to disclose subscribe. Because keep an eye on NVIDIA. Uh, look, it's, it's a bellwether for, I suppose, confidence. It's also taking a bit of a hit this morning. Uh, we're going to wrap up the week for you. Stocks are really trying to steady uh, themselves for now. This is what you need to know for your trading diary uh, for next week. Fed President Austin Goolsby speaking at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. And moving to next week, Tesla results are out. More from IBM, Meta, Boeing report on Wednesday. Alphabet, Microsoft on Thursday. And you, Mitch, on Friday.